So I just wanted to uh, briefly explain the mission of the art and blockchain and why we're doing this, as well as um, explain a little bit about the exhibition that is surrounding you right now. Um, so the mission of the art and blockchain is to educate the public about what is blockchain. Um, but the way that we're going to do this is we're going we're gonna to break it down to the very, very basic level of what the blockchain actually really taps into value, which is what the exhibition is about, ownership, authenticity, um, scarcity, security, identity, a whole bunch of things like that. We are also going to make it so that it's a traveling art exhibition and panel discussion so that we are going to be covering a bunch of different areas in the United States that are not normally um, within this realm. We want to we wanna expand the circle. We want to add more creators, we want to add more teachers, uh, we want to add more artists, we want to add more philosophers in this, in this realm. Um, and so yeah, we want, to, we, want to, we want to make the circle bigger. And I think it's going to benefit everyone, actually, in this realm. For the, the first exhibition, it's called Alternative Barter, A New Method of Exchange. You'll see there's three artists in this show that utilizes ordinary objects that normally would be nothing. But once these objects are incorporated into their work, it's valuable. It's worth something. So that's something to really think about in terms of what is value. Who decides what the value of something is? Um, so these are sort of investigations that we want to we want to do. We want to start to rethink these definitions that we've lived by, on and on, uh, that we were born with. We want to start to reinvestigate. We want to we want to redefine because this is what I think what the blockchain is going to be doing for the public. The digital pieces also is really important now with these digital works. You can actually create scarcity with the blockchain. And, um, thanks to smart contracts. You can actually set limited editions where in the past you, you know, were not able to. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a real thing and it's happening and it's around us and this is why we are involved and this is why we have the art and blockchain. Um, so now I'm gonna introduce Noah Workman who is my partner and also going to moderate the amazing panelists uh, this evening. Awesome. Thank you, Pia. Um. <laughs> Yay! All right. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming and being here, our wonderful panelists and everybody sitting up there. Thanks to BX, uh, which is where we are, for giving us the use of this space. Um, Luke, Connor, and Iris Media Works team for videotaping. Helena, who Pia mentioned, that's another essential part of art and blockchain and is busy bringing another human into this world. That's why she can't be here. Um, Eight-month-olds don't fly so well, we've learned. Um, and of course, thanks to the amazing artists who you'll hopefully get a chance to meet some of them, whose work is on the wall, um, and our panelists. So I'm going to introduce everybody really quickly, but before I do that, we're going to do a quick poll. Just raise your hand, yes or no. There won't be a test afterwards. All right, here we go. Raise your hand if you're an artist as you define it. All right. Raise your hand if you're a collector, which I'm defining as spending more than $100 or the crypto equivalent on what you consider art in the past like five months. All right, cool. This one's like a lightning round. Raise your hand if you own Bitcoin. Raise your hand if you own Ethereum. Raise your hand if you own Dogecoin. Oh, raise your hand if you own Bitcoin. Well, good for you. It's a hair that's going up in value. Um, great. Uh, Monero? All right. All right. A lot of similar faces here. Cool. That's good. Did I miss one? Anything else, I sh anything else you want to know there? All right. Cool. All right. This one's the most complicated and the last one of these. Raise your hand if you've ever exchanged a cryptocurrency for something other than another cryptocurrency or fiat currency. Oh, that's cool. 
That's, that's high level density of people exchanging. Yeah, right? Great. So with us today, Roni Rose is the founder of Blockchain B, a podcast dedicated to educating the public on crypto in a fun and relatable way. I've listened to them. They are both fun and relatable and pleasant. I recommend it. Um, Jessica is a full-time artist. She's developing large-scale public project. You can learn about her work at artproject.io or jessicaangelarts.com. She also wants you to know she has a little giveaway in her bag, so go make friends with her. Sarah, who's sitting right next to me, is an artist. Uh, she created Cloud of Petals, where a team of photographers, um, or sorry, well, a team of photographers? A team of people, a team of men. Oh, men in their 40s. Different ages? Men of different ages digitized over 100,000 petals, picked the ones they liked the most, it's, it's a really cool project, and uploaded them to the cloud. She also created Bitcoin um, way back in 2015, right? Which is a cryptocurrency backed by photographic area, right? Is that fair? Cool. Um, and then all the way on the end there is John Zettler, who's the co-founder of Rare Art Labs, which I hope everyone checks out. Um, the first platform for artists to sell scarce copies of their digital works, and that's something Pia mentioned. So kind of in honor of one of the people that passed today that was important to me and a question that's not on here, I'm gonna ask you each really quickly two things. One, what is the most important and relevant to this conversation piece of information I left out of your bio that everyone should know. And two, real quick, what makes you happy? Happy. happy. You want to start? <laughs> Where do you want to go last? Go All right. We're going to start with you, John. So maybe the first thing that uh, needs to be corrected about the bio was that uh, we weren't the first to be the first marketplace. That's what uh, it says on your website. A lot of people out there claiming that first one. I don't know if anyone else... Tra Travis, I was just joking. So we can all be the first, okay? We're all, this is still one building, it's still one room. We can all be the first together. But, uh, and then in terms of what makes me happy, I would say uh, creating um, businesses, projects, and so forth. And can you all hear John, or does he need to hold the mic closer? A little bit hold, a little yeah, bit closer. Yeah, we're gonna go real close. Yeah. Like ad lib close. Time. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, the first piece left out of my bio or not left out, my name is pronounced Ronnie. And I asked you that. I gave mm. him a warning ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also, another aspect that my podcast focuses on is introducing people to companies that are using blockchain for social good. A lot of people focus on the world of cryptocurrencies, trading them and getting rich, but this technology has the power to, um, to really uplift people around the world no matter what their community situation is. Whether you're in Manhattan or whether you are in a developing community in India, you still have the same access to these decentralized tools. Uh, and what makes me happy is my dog, uh, <laughs> of course. My sister, she's here. Uh, and also leading people, speaking to people, and just collaboration. Um, okay, so I would like to add to my intro, um, kind of talk a little bit about this project that I am developing. Uh, it's um, the idea is to create a physical manifestation of how the blockchain works uh, from a very crafty sort of perspective. So I'm working with uh, engineers and architects into creating this huge building made out of steel where um, all these different interactions are happening inside of. So it's like a little museum for blockchain projects. So uh, I just wanna invite you to take a look at it in case you feel like you wanna collaborate or be part of it. So just a little invitation there. And what makes me happy? Um, being really busy makes me very happy. And you know, knowing that my family is around and being surrounded by people who matter. Um, the, I guess I'll add that the 100,000 photographs were used as a data set for a machine learning algorithm called a generative adversarial net to generate new images of rose petals. So I have endless, I have endless rose petals. Um, 
And I also have endless bitch coin. No, that's not true. But, um, <laughs> and I guess what makes me happy is my, my loved ones. Yeah, that's like ultimately. That's awesome. Thank you. So first question. Um, how has, how you, how you think of exchange, how you think of money, how has that changed in the past four years? Um, or has it changed in the past four years? And if so, how? And I, I put the four years on there only because I think we're getting towards like wider spread, more than 0.001% of people knowing what currency is. Um, you want to start? Sure. Value exchange. So, yeah, so how do money, you, how yeah, do there's my cheat sheet. Okay. How do you think, how do you think exchange value and then I propose even money has changed or do you think it's changed or is it yeah. the same old thing? Yeah, well, I, I definitely think of, you know, value only exists in exchange and it's only when one is in the place of the other and that you have that comparison uh, that value even emerges. And so uh, metaphorically, I've compared it many times in my work to a reflection, um, the way like a three-dimensional object may appraise itself in a sense in two dimensions and remove like, yeah, remove a dimension in a sense. And you get an image that without forsaking detail or clarity gives like a pretty good representation which is what a price is supposed to do. Um, and so, so, but then, you know, part of my work is also that like value is manipulated all the time and that it's very easy to manipulate value. And like, you know, one of the projects I did, I manipulated stocks on the New York Stock Exchange and then would gesturally redraw, redraw them on canvases, right? And like LIBOR, right, which is, has trillions of dollars traded every day, even that was manipulated. And, but like, it's difficult to, to, you know, we're all, like, it's all humans dealing with this stuff. So it's impossible, like, not to manipulate something. Um, and the line of, the line is, like, very, very gray. Uh, so I guess that's, like, where I'm thinking about value and exchange. And in terms of money, uh, really, it's a legal question because money is only defined legally as it's legal tender. Things can have currency. Currency can be an adjective used to describe something like airline miles have currency. You can trade them, you can spend them, like you can keep them, um, you can give them. And even to a certain extent, I would argue that stocks like can act like currency. Like you can give someone a stock like and pay them in a stock. You can donate that to like a nonprofit. Well, do you think so? Given that, do you think has that has your opinion and how you've thought about that changed relative to like the expansion of crypto? Like in, in yeah. this time frame, has that changed from one point to another, or has that kind of been the basis of your work since you got started? I wanted it to change when I did Bitcoin in like 2015, and it got like you know I clearly had like pressed a button. People reacted to it. There was press like this idea of like a backed currency you know, that was an individual creating it. Uh, it, you know, it captured people's attention. And I thought like, wow, like, wouldn't it be great if instead of, you know, all of the United States being legally forced to pay debts back in the US dollar, thereby making any other currency at least legally, like, kind of moot. Um, wouldn't it be great if there was, there were many currencies and you could decide like which one to have and we have the benefit of being in the United States where we have a pretty stable currency but think about people like in Argentina for example that have had wild swings in their currency like Bitcoin took off there you know because there was a gap to fill when your government is corrupt and like manipulating your money supply like yeah like cryptocurrencies make a ton of sense. Um, so, I'm gonna, uh, can I jump in? Mine? Yeah. Is that okay? Yep. Um, with a contrarian opinion. Uh, but with <laughs> Only respect. if you disagree. I do disagree. Okay. Um, and my disagreement is this. I think nothing's changed to start. Um, at the very core of it all, money or currency is nothing more than an abstraction for barter. That's all it is. You have a service, Abraham codes for me, so I pay him in something that I earn from doing something for someone else. There are many different systems 
for that fungibility of favor trade or of barters. One is the U.S. system, and that's the U.S. dollar that has the U.S. courts, that has the U.S. military. It's a pretty good system, and I collect a lot of those dollars. But there are many other systems. There is the European Union. There is the British pound. There is Bitcoin, um, or there is even you know, gold as one of the oldest mechanisms of fungible uh, favor trading. So, you know, I, I want to take a step back and think that I don't think this is very different from a value perspective. Um, and I also, I think one thing that Sarah touched on that is very interesting is this idea of value and of what creates it versus what, you know, in, in your point, to your point as I understood it was that value is created upon exchange. And, and I agree with that because exchanges are value additive because two parties come together voluntarily to transact. But we can build value without exchange. Exchange just quantifies how much it is to us. Like, I can never sell a piece of art that I make or a piece of code that I write, but that still is very valuable to me. Jessica. May, may I add? Yes. Uh, so you both uh, are saying that value does not exist if there's no transaction. And I believe that value is inherent on anything that we do. Uh, and the fact that there may be a disconnect between the two is kind of a different story. But the value of art, for example, is not necessarily, um, what's the word, like, uh, quantified by how much it costs, but how much it kind of contributes to the overall um, culture. And it has nothing to do with how much, how much you sell it for. So I disagree with that. Well, I believe that, in that sense, value is a very personal decision. But value in terms of money, uh, it does depend on exchange. And frankly, I think nothing is inherently valuable that doesn't contribute to our, uh, our health, our personal well-being. You know, my idea of value really changed during the 2008 economic crisis. You know, seeing, um, seeing a home that used to sell for $700,000 being foreclosed and auctioned for $300,000. You know, my parents growing up, I remember they always said uh, they were sort of jealous of people who owned a lot of property as an investment. And that was something that they aspired to, to do, to own. Uh, but then in one year, everything just crashes. There's no inherent value to these homes. Now, of course, people will continue to pay for things that contribute to their life. If that's food, if that's medicine, it has that elasticity of demand. Um, but Cryptocurrency and Bitcoin has value until we say it doesn't. Art has value until we say it doesn't. And art that you look at and appreciate, I could look at and be like, I don't get it. I, I wouldn't pay money for it. Yeah, but there's something, value is a broader concept. It doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily speak about uh, currency. There's something called cultural value. How do you quantify cultural value? Right. So like, like, that's what I'm talking about when, when I say that uh, there's no need for, for a transaction to happen for anything to have value or to compare it to something else for it mm -hmm. to have value. There are different values like, how do I feel about this? How does it make me feel? How, does, how, how do I, uh, be, how, how am I a better artist by looking at this? Mm -hmm. How am I gonna develop as a person? Well, let's... Right. So maybe we can talk about what value is. Right, so well, that's kind of the next, in my wildest fantasies I was gonna assemble everything you just said and divide it into different camps, but I'm gonna do that after I watch this video like eight times and see if I can make a Venn diagram. Uh, differing opinions already. Well, this relates, these questions all relate to each other. So my next question is, do artists have a role in creating value, right? We have some different opinions on value and I'd love to hear whether artists are relevant to that and have anything to say. So actually, I wanted to Bound, this applies, and I wanted to bounce off of that. You reminded me, like during World War II when the Nazis stole a bunch of art, uh, you know, the Allies didn't want to just take it back because it was worth a lot of money, but because it had a lot of cultural value to it. Um, so definitely art can have this value that is priceless, certainly. And the value of like, you know, and like looking at something and appreciating it, there's like, there's kind of an exchange there too. It's not like a monetary exchange, but there is, you know, a reaction. There is like two parts. It's not 
like the artwork doesn't like exist in a vacuum where like no one you know no one's on the other side. But um, sorry, that uh, I forgot your question. You want me to jump in with that with your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yours was around value, right? And does an artist have a role in creating value? Yes. yes. Uh, and I would say absolutely. Oh, yeah. Like of course, because artists are exactly. The, the role of the artist in society, in my opinion, is to interpret ideas, it's to comment on ideas, and it's to teach ideas. And I think that process of identifying, explaining, and thinking about ideas and teaching them, whether they're societal or um, very meta level with value and, and, and value found in, in little trinkets, um, but more generally, I think it is the role of the artist to help explain and teach that, and, and that in and of itself is something that is very valuable for society because there is always that, you know, even that uh, the joke, does, you know, does art predict society or does society predict art? Um, does one, is one dependent on the other, effectively? It's a chicken and the egg old dilemma, and I think more than anything, it's just a loop. I think one fuels the other, artists teach society, society then influences artists' work. Um, yeah, I mean, that's why we're talking about creators. The word itself is telling us that there's something new happening. So there is the value in the creation. Uh, when we think about creators, when we think about scientists, when we think about uh, philosophers, artists, we are together creating the value of society. That it may not even be uh, something that we can perceive and evaluate right now. It's actually something that takes longer for it to have an impact on the culture or society. So, for example, when I think about blockchain as what it means to society, I almost see it as same as what art means to society. It's something that takes a while. It's almost like a mindset, of a way of thinking. So when we think about art as how can we use art to, to explain or to, yeah. to make comments, commentary or whatever, I think, uh, yeah, art works for that, but art in the main core of it, it's like a crazy scientist in a lab really creating visual thinking. So is that like a, a difference that, that I can understand in this context, which is there's, there seems to be a little bit of a difference, which I think is interesting, in the idea that artists are creating kind of the, the definitions. They're just really far ahead of the curve. And John, you're saying that you see it as cyclical and that there's actually between maybe the non-artists and non-creators of the world. But uh, is I that would, a fair? I would say rather it's reflexive. Reflexive, okay. Such that one influences the other. Right. Um, and I think they coexist at the same time together, but in the same way that society assigns value, I would assume, and I'm making big assumptions, that this artist was influenced by society and her or his experiences with society to then infer inference you know, what was going to go on the wall. Uh, but at the same time, this is then a commentary on society that we can then appreciate and reflect upon our own society. Oh, Susan, I hope, who is here, the awesome artist is here, that's Susan. And she's definitely gonna have some things to say, which I'm excited to hear about. So I'm gonna let you be the deciding vote here. Do, are, is, are artists reacting to the world around them, the world reacting to artists, artists reacting to the world, and then we get, get this kind of sense of value? Or are artists this like bloody, bloody edge that are defining our future through the act of creation? You, you have to pick it. No, you don't have to pick a side at all. <laughs> I, I think it's like a huge responsibility to place like artists are on the like bleeding edge, creating like artists are on the periphery always. And that's how they like, you know, glean insights uh, and create work that's like meaningful. They're not, you know, they're not like actually making decisions about, I don't know, like monetary, pol like uh, artists are on the, and, and I would argue that like even the great works of art sometimes like stand aside from, you know, the society in which they were created, like the Sistine Chapel, right? That's like a reflection of like papal power, but it's also just a beautiful work of art that stands the test of time and is apart from all of that, right? And like taps into kind of deeper things. So I don't know if what I agree with as a result. <laughs> Can well, I can I ask you guys a quick time. question? It's not one or the other though. Right. And so I'm not an artist. I come from the blockchain world. You guys come from the art and blockchain world. 
Do you guys create for your audience or do you create for yourself and just wait for the audience to come? Oh, I was Good question, Ronnie. Um, I think uh, I create uh, for the world okay. in a sense that I, I am a medium that puts together different elements like you're saying uh, this artwork is influenced by all these things, but the mixture of the different influences is what makes it a creation. Obviously, you're not gonna invent things that are already there. A creation is not coming out from scratch. It's just how, do, how you combine the elements and make a new dialogue between things. So it's for me, obviously, because it comes from me. I have to like it, I have to agree with it, but it certainly is for for the world or for, for a, a larger cause, in my opinion, my experience. You create with them in mind. Yes, definitely. Okay. <laughs> You're like I that. create both for myself and for the world. <laughs> Thank you. John, do you want to? Uh, I would say I enjoy the process of creating. So in that way, it is self-gratifying, but it is for the world. Um, and the ironic thing about <laughs> building startups that are on frontier technology is that you very much are going out on a limb, um, hoping that the collectors will be there. Because yeah. we can build the tech and we can build better experiences for artists in a more fair way for artists to get paid, but will the collectors be there? If you build it, will they come? True. Yeah. And so I think in that, in that said, sense, if you build it, will they come? In that sense, you know, building businesses and startups, particularly who are trying to solve big problems in the world, it's quite similar. I mean, you are, it is a project in and of itself. Um, there are a lot of assumptions that are going into it. It's also based off society and hoping to influence society. So maybe that creative drive that brings, you know, there is unification in that drive, creative drive. So, as we've already been talking, I realize we should talk a little bit about exchange, right? And, and what that word means. There were a couple of comments that everybody had where I'm like, oh, we haven't defined exchange. So I guess uh, the question is, do things have value in and of themselves, right? Or is value literally a measure of what they're exchanged for? I say it's both things. And they sometimes may not agree with each other something may have inherent value and not have a uh, exchange value. But then, so then what is this ag the agreed upon price? And I don't mean like a, necessarily a fiat price, but even the agreed to trade, I suppose, how is that ultimately settled? I mean, there's also, you know, somebody coming to see an art installation more than once. Is that an exchange? They're exchanging their time because they're so impacted by it. They have to see it again and again and again. Just because there's no monetary transaction there doesn't mean that there's no value, no benefit. You know? Uh, my two cents would be that yes, things have value without exchange in the same way that I can build something for myself that I like or that I use. Maybe it's an invention that helps me flush a toilet, you know? Anything that I create Interestingly can have specific. The, sure, yeah. <laughs> and. Now you've got me. Uh, and, and, uh, and I would say, but at the same time, the quantification of that, like I, I do believe that in exchange there is value creation as long as both sides are voluntary because both sides want the other thing more than what they're giving up. So things can have value in and of themselves, but then more value can be created in the world when you exchange two things that two different parties would rather have the other side of. It, a Coca-Cola versus $2.50 or on the flip side of that, you know, I, you know, on the, the seller of that as well, rather having the, the you know, the, the dollars than the Coca-Cola. So it's, so with John's company, it's going to be really interesting because you're going to have insights on fluctuation of value of different pieces. I kind of look forward to that blog post or article. Um, but Sarah, this is, an interesting thing for you to speak to because you, you know, for Bitcoin set the value of one Bitcoin at 25 square inches of photograph. Why wasn't it 24 square inches of photograph? I like like nice precise numbers um, because because um, because of like communication and storytelling the way like 
I got 10,000 roses and 100,000 images. Like, I made sure we got 100,000 images because, like, you know, for communicating it, like, really helps. 25 square inches was easy, five by five inches. I made the prints, like, a weird size so that they would fit that. But essentially, in that way, it kind of functioned also like an option. So you were also, in a sense, betting on me as an artist. And that was the sort of joke and fun of it. Like, this is the first artwork I'm creating. I'm turning myself into a currency. Buy into me now. Uh, and, and part of it was like commenting about the art market um, as well. Uh, and the photographs I created, I called speculations. And they were made with two-way mirrors. And they create this like infinite tunnel. Um, so yeah, it was like creating an option. Like it was like a bet. So what I find fascinating about this is value, your, the value, you m determined a value that a market then figured out, but at the core of you setting this value was an artistic feeling that people like round numbers or like numbers that end in like a bunch of zeros or fives and things like that. So that, that actually, I'm going to segue that into my next question because it kind of relates, I think. Um, so the question is, has the idea of exchange been fully explored? I think the answer is no, and I've learned that today. Um, but you can all chime in or agree. So do we know all the ways we can potentially transact? If we don't know the ways that we can transact, where are we headed? Um, and we're going to tie this now more closely into blockchain, because I'm going to ask you to, to kind of talk a little bit about how that relates to these trades and, and whether technology enables us to explore those things if we don't have a clear and defined answer. Yeah, um, oh, no, please, go ahead. I'll, I was just thinking about open source, for example, after your question. Would that be a way to transact? Can we think about open source as some sort of bartering for just building up a community that grows organically without uh, any set limits? I don't know. Uh, well, one thing that I've started to dive into is uh, the idea of fractional ownership. Mm -hmm. So for anyone here who isn't familiar with the blockchain world, uh, one of the main things that we're doing is tokenizing things, which basically you create like a digital representation of something. Uh, so you can create a token that is backed by a photograph. And you can have several tokens that are backed only by that specific photograph or that specific piece of art. So I love the idea of fractional ownership because it can be applied to so many different things like real estate, art, etc. Uh, and personally, I am not an art collector, uh, mostly because I'm broke. And second, because I'm very indecisive. You know, if I have a piece of art hanging in my home, the next month I'm going to want something new. So one idea that I've been really interested in is shared ownership, is uh, fractional ownership of art pieces. Let's say this entire community owns one painting, okay? And that painting is tokenized. So there are 30 tokens to that painting, and we all own uh, a piece of each token. And that painting can travel from owner to owner. And as it travels, we're compensated for it. You know, internet of things. So this painting is connected to the internet, has some sort of chip in it. And every time it moves to a different home, their wallet automatically sends us money. We own this and it travels the world and it goes from person to person. Maybe it makes art more affordable for people. Like I said, I'm broke, I can't afford it. Uh, but that's what I really love, fractional ownership, mm -hmm. shared ownership. Uh, <laughs> going to take another contrarian opinion uh, and respectfully. <laughs> I wholly disagree, uh, and the reason I wholly disagree is because that makes no sense to me. Uh, to be frank, if a physical piece of work was owned by multiple people, one person gets to enjoy it because one person puts it on their wall. Um, if you were to sell 49% fractional interest in that ownership, so a minority stake in that artwork, what rights do those people have? Why do they do that? Are they doing it solely because of its investment value? Well, that feels a bit perverse, right? Because that feels like we're basically just chopping up the value into little bits of ownership that you can only ever sell once if the entire painting was sold so 100% ownership rights were acquired and thus you then get compensated, hopefully some capital gain. 
To me, I don't get that. I think, I, yeah, and I think physical assets are an even worse idea of putting on the blockchain. And why I think that's a worse idea is two things. Number one is if there's a fork, who decides who owns the apartment? Okay, so a fork is what happens. A fork happens is when the code is split because there's an upgrade. This has happened on Bitcoin multiple times. You might have heard of Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Green, yada, yada, yada. And Ethereum has had uh, already two with the consideration of a third coming. So there's Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. And there might be a fork coming while we move to proof of stake versus proof of work. So when you are judging which chain is true chain, that's a decision for the miners and for people ascribe, to ascribe value to the chain. It is not the role of the chain to decide who has a lien on the physical asset. That's the role of the court system and that's the role of the police to decide who owns and, and assign that value. And then besides, the one last thing I wanna say besides forking, that's, that's well, the reason I don't like this is also what happens if Ethereum doesn't work? And what happens if we have to move everything to EOS? We're, then are we gonna just say that like, won't. what's that? We won't. Okay, sure. <laughs> wait, no, no, but I, all right, so wait, hold on, because I don't even know if I disagree or agree with you yet. Are you saying, because you seem, what you seem to be identifying are governance issues. Like, this is where I'm a little confused. Are you telling yes. me, John, that you don't think physical things, ownership of physical things using smart contracts can be blocked? I think it's a terrible shame. idea. I think it's a terrible idea. And so, the reason I think it's a terrible okay. idea is because in the physical world, in three-dimensional space that we live and operate in, governance has to be defined by someone physically restraining you. Because otherwise I could, take, I could take the painting, okay. right? So it is the role of the physical existence of our physical being and our physical court systems, physical police to assign who has the right to have that painting or to live in that space that we call an apartment in New York, which is really a shoebox. So uh, but that's my attitude. And so I, that's why I think that, that digital systems like Ethereum are really good for the management of natively digital assets but I disagree with using the blockchain as a record for anything physical because I foresee too many problems with that. Mm -hmm. So you definitely have a valid point. Uh, actually, I need that mic, thank you. You definitely have a valid point. Uh, people who own assets want to know that they're uh, legally protected. You know, I, I'm personally going into the real estate world and I wrote an article right now about uh, blockchain and real estate and fractional ownership. And my first question was, how do people prove that this is theirs? You know, what if, uh, what if it comes under context, uh, contest and somebody in a different country who owns a piece of an apartment in New York uh, wants, to, wants to say, hey, I own this. There is a balance between centralized and decentralized. So there are certain tokens where you can design them uh, to make sure that they're only sent to addresses who have been uh, verified with KYC, know your customer, it's basically like a platform getting the information on you, who you are, this is your address. So we can make sure that this address is tied to you and it's legally defensible. You own that property well, by the government. So can we, we're gonna, I'm gonna actually back this into my next question. I'll send you my article. Yes, <laughs> yes, and we'll, we'll you post learn. the article. Um, okay, because I know right now we were talking about physical property, but for me personally, maybe, you all disagree. Some of this relates to the idea of fiat currency because like the idea of ownership that you're mentioning, John, fiat currency want, is, is backed by good faith in government, right? And actually I'm gonna take a quick second because there's so many more people here than there were a little earlier. We're gonna do a quick hand raising again. Who here owns any type of cryptocurrency? Who here knows what a smart contract is. All right, okay. Okay, cool. So. Um, if you don't, listen to my podcast. Yes, if you don't, listen to Ronnie's podcast, it's actually pretty cool. It's episode one, no, episode two. Episode three. Episode, episode three, all right. it's bound to get it. Um, all right, so let's keep talking about the physical world, but let's use fiat currency, something that is backed by the threat of violence, the promise of opportunity, um, the faith in our government, right? Um, it is an internet, but, it, but that's true. That's, that's, you find that the larger the military expenditure per GDP, percent GDP, oftentimes the more respect 
expected, more tradable, fungible, maybe not Russia, but um, okay, so I've already poked holes in that. So I'm just gonna jump to my question. So is fiat currency a necessary part of being a working artist, right? That's the first part. Um, and my next question, part of that is like, what does that mean? If we need to have cash money, do we need to have cash money? Um, let's define fiat as, 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 a, as a dollar, it doesn't need to actually be cold hard cash, but rather an asset backed by a nation state. Um, is that a fair definition? Cool, that's my question. Do, you want to start? do, artists. do artists need fiat currency? Yes. Like no matter what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, because we operate in the real world and the landlords need rent and they're not going to accept Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> I tried, I tried. Um, and, and also, it, I, I, I do agree, yeah, and, and that goes back to the issue of like where we operate physically and how we operate digitally. And one of the things about physical artworks is it's expensive to ship artworks. It's expensive to move them. It's expensive to store them. It's expensive to insure them. It's expensive to care for them. And so to put it to, to like think that, you know what, if we put it on the blockchain, it's like a digital thing now. We can just, like I can just send it to you, is to forget, forget about the artwork, really. I don't think it's necessarily fiat. I think they need a stable, globally accepted currency. That's what you need. Because fiat is not that dependable. You know, Venezuela used to be the richest country in Latin America, and now they, they'd rather use their paper money than toilet paper because it's cheaper. Uh, so yeah. I would take it back to my previous comment of just systems. Um, you're gonna need the currency <laughs> of the system in which you live. If that system is within the boundaries of the United States where your landlords will only accept dollar and not Bitcoin, idiots, uh, and then you need to operate in that collectible, which is the fungible US dollar. Now, on the flip side, if I was in Paris or if I was in Berlin, um, that would be the euro because I'm existing in that system of operation, that court system, that legal system, that police system, that governance system. Um, and what the interesting thing to me about Ethereum, and pretty much only Ethereum of all the cryptocurrencies, is that this feels to me like this is going to be the currency of the system which is going to be the decentralized internet. And so the decentralized internet will be similar in some ways to a nation state. It will control information flow around the globe, around humans hopefully beyond the globe eventually. And the currency through which that can then be traded in trustless ways, and that's a conversation maybe for later or another time, um, but the idea that a, a computer could say, okay, I'm going to do the escrow service of holding the asset and the dollar and then swapping them instead of paying for an expensive lawyer to do that. Um, these are the reasons why smart contracts are important, and I think that the currency of the smart contract system and decentralized internet system that I'm going to most participate in in the future is going to be Ethereum, and thus I collect Ethereum. Yeah, I agree. We agree on something. <laughs> I have two, like, kind of questions, but you can ignore them. You can say it's not, okay. Hello. One question is, like, what happens, like, if the internet is not decentralized and if it's like totally substratum you know, it's you know the internet in the US looks like nothing like the internet in China for example and how does that affect uh, like the range of what's possible with something like ethereum um, that's my first question. Well, there are companies that are building, I mentioned substratum, there are companies that are building decentralized internet. You know, each person's server acts as uh, a server of the internet um, and they support each other that way. And there's also mesh networking. Um, so when net neutrality came into question, substratum put like a huge push into, hey, you can come join us and then you don't have to deal with uh, repealing net neutrality. My second one was, 
I, I read recently, I did a, a question um, about like what it takes to mine cryptocurrencies, right? And the like physical environmental impact and also how akin it is to physical mining in the sense that you can only do it in very specific locations, right? Where energy is cheap enough. You can only use the most sophisticated equipment. Otherwise, you're not competitive. Um, and like, you know, it's using also a huge amount. It's taking a toll on the planet. Um, and I wonder how, how that plays into it. Because there's definitely, I feel at least, like a, like a moral question of do I want to exchange in this when I know that it is that environmentally damaging to do so? Um, and as an artist, like I think about like the morals of what I'm making. Um, so, uh, first, to gauge my audience, uh, can you raise your hand if you feel like you comfortably know what cryptocurrency mining is? Okay, about half. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna assume that, the, and yes. So my thought process there is that, so first and foremost, um, a few lifetimes ago, I was a power and energy banker. Um, and so I keep up on the power markets, as you know, normal people do. Of course uh, you do. And, and uh, Jewel Magazine, uh, which is a, you know, a uh, industry rag, uh, recently ran a piece by some very intelligent scientists who found that they believe they've estimated 0.5% of all energy expenditure globally is going to cryptocurrency mining. 0.5%. So one out of 200 megawatts that are being used in the world that are being sometimes frequently burned with fossil fuels to create that electricity, um, that is what is happening today. So there are solutions to that. I think, like, I think that's a really good point, Sarah, that you brought up. Like, what are the negative externalities of all this that we're not seeing? And I think that's a really good one because the current system for mining, particularly under proof of work systems, which is a one sentence explanation, is that you have to prove by hard effort that you are a meritous actor and updating the chain responsibly. And you prove that by investing a lot of money in your rigs and in power, um, because otherwise you'd be losing all that. Now, there's a push towards proof of stake, which is a new, uh, more wasteless uh, type of uh, consensus algorithms. So that is hope for that. But I think that that's a really good point, Sarah, that really doesn't get brought up enough in these uh, communities and these discussions. And so I'm glad that that was talked about today because there is a evil side to all this that while we're talking about this new decentralized internet, there is currently at least a very inefficient energy expenditure that is being used primarily by burning fossil fuels. All right. um, may I say something? Yes, you may. Um, I've asked myself the same question, and for some reason, I tend to be positive about it and think that maybe these challenges in energy are what we may need to really take the step forward and get rid of it. We need to overcome uh, that. Get rid of what? Let's say uh, fossil fuels. Uh, perhaps try and use blockchain with uh, clean energy or other sources of energy that actually uh, fulfill the necessities. So I have many opinions on that, but yeah. two, one really cool thing that you said, which has certainly got me thinking is the internet, and I tend to, and I don't know how many other people here tend to think of the internet as a whole thing, but it's not, the internet is very different. And I, don't, I, I maybe I think of it as different places because of different bandwidth speeds, but it's really a totally different thing in China, for example, or North Korea or Venezuela. So that's really interesting. And um, in terms of energy, oh, I wish we could talk about this. This is, this is but we're gonna, I'm gonna have, I got like one more question for you, but I, I will say, um, I look forward to artists exploring it. I look forward to, some of the smartest, most technically adept people with trillions of fiat currency, crypto dollars on the line exploring these issues. And I, I do like your approach, Jessica, that maybe this is nudging some of the effort that we need to like explore this, because uh, proof of stake has huge issues. But I'm gonna open this up um, 
for people who didn't raise their hand about what this is about. So the mission of art and blockchain is to create a public understanding of what blockchain is, right? How decentralized systems could change the way we transact, how we interact, and how we view trust. And so what's getting real close to our final question before we take some Q&A um, is uh, let's unpack that, right? So for each one of you, what is public understanding? Like is that measured by action, ideology, lack of complacency, complacency, something like that. Um, what is trust? Like, what does it mean to trust? Um, and is this something that blockchain could do? I'll, I can repeat, the, we, yeah, no, I know, it's five oh, questions yeah. in one, right? And is that something blockchain can do? And just to keep it interesting, like, what's the role of artists in that? So, here we go. What's public understanding? What's trust? Can blockchain help us out with that? Um, and do artists have a place in making it happen? I, I can start. Oh. Well, I think about public understanding, and that brings me back to what I was saying before about um, the value in, the, in culture, how we artists, philosophers, or scientists uh, create the culture. And public understanding, in a sense, is kind of a drawback of what is built before. I have a feeling that public understanding lags behind uh, the creative energy from whether it's artists, thinkers, uh, futurists, whatever you want to name them, creators. Um, so yeah, that's what I think public understanding is. It's just kind of a, a drawback of what is created before. So in blockchain, public understanding, in my opinion, is something that is going to take a while for it to be digested by the society as a whole. Uh, the second one, trust. Um, I think trust almost en entails doubt <laughs> in a way. When you think about trust, you're already uh, talking about the possibility of something not going right. Um, and then the third one? Um, I'll check my notes. Um, does that make sense? I mean, it's a little weird, but that's why we talk about trustless computations because you don't have to deal with that problem of trust. So it's almost like trust is a problem. So the last part of it was what is the role of artists in making any of this? Yeah, no, about. definitely. I just go back to, to my initial thought that artists are creative forces that have a great impact on the visual thinking of this public understanding of the world. So. Uh, so with public understanding, I'm in a lot of uh, crypto Facebook groups. And people like to post like, hey, my, uh, my dad just bought Bitcoin, mass adoption. I don't count that as mass adoption. Uh, you know, somebody buying Bitcoin because they think it's going to the moon, that's not, that's not mass adoption. That's not them using blockchain technology to benefit their lives. Um, a, a woman farmer in Guatemala receiving a uh, solar panel unit uh, to light her evenings when she's still working instead of using a kerosene lamp. And she makes payments through tokens. Uh, and as she's making those payments every month to own this, this solar unit, uh, it's building credit for her. That's mass adoption. That's people using it to improve their lives. Um, and as for trust, I think a lot of companies are building pointless products that they say it's decentralized, but really they just don't want to deal with customer service and liability. Um, <laughs> people, so I was at a conference and uh, I've met a friend uh, who's actually a friend of my sister's and I asked him what he's working on. He said, we're building a decentralized exchange for stock photos. I'm like, why do you need that? Um, I didn't say that to his face. I hope he doesn't watch this. Uh, so, so people like to have a face there. Decentralized is great when it empowers people and helps them come out of their own circumstances, but when it's something where you want that human connection, you want customer service, that trust is irreplaceable. You can't just replace that with a trustless system. People want to have to trust a human. I think uh, a lot of those questions have been answered, so I'll leave you just with one story, uh, and that story is of one of our artists, um, and his name is Osinachi. Um, he's based in Nigeria, in a relatively rural spot, uh, and he's an information librarian. So he helps uh, manage the databases, 
uh, the research library, and all the other assets that students at this university need. Um, he's also an artist, um, a poet, and an author, and a visual artist. And his visual art, he actually makes entirely in Microsoft Word. And you should see these. They are amazing. And the most interesting thing is I asked him about it when we were on a Skype call, and he mentioned that you know, it's very hard to get the either computers that are strong enough to run Adobe Photoshop and other high, more advanced software packages that we even take for granted here in the States. But what I find so interesting is that he has now tokenized a few works with us that will go on sale on June 26 at the release of our beta, which we're all very excited for. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, his works will be for sale. And so now we have an opportunity for an instant transaction of a global buyer, perhaps in this room, purchasing a work from a Nigerian-based artist in a much lower cost of living area, um, who's already talking to all of his artist peers in Nigeria to try and spread this idea that they can now sell digital art for the first time and sell it to relatively wealthy buyers across the globe in places like the States. That to me is what I think the beauty of the next internet revolution that we're going into. Um, and that's what I'm really looking forward to. Uh, in the question of trust, I think that, I mean, in a sense, the, the cost, like the cost of mining, right? Which now the lower bound on Bitcoin is supposed to be like $8,000 purely because of the supply cost of mining, not demand driven at all. And I think that in a sense is the cost of trust, right? Um, like that we've created financial systems, but we've decided to like create something other than that because we don't want to trust like the normal system. Um, so that's like the cost of trust. And the way, I mean, as an artist, I just try to like use this all this material and like make a show out of it. All right, so this is gonna be our, f our final question. Um, I'm gonna say like what I love about the blockchain world and as I define trust is the ability to reliably predict um, a person or a system's next action. Um, it is that relationship that, that for me defines trust. Um, I would like, and I, and, and, and I would like a decentralized stock photo system because sometimes I have to pay $1,400 for a photo of like the sun. And I'm like, why? Someone would take $20 for this. And then I just go and take it myself sometimes. So, so last thing, um, the last the thing I'm gonna say is really quickly, um, for people who wanna be involved, right? Um, Let's, let's talk to the people who've been wondering this whole time what the heck we're talking about. So for the beginners, what's the coolest, I know you have an answer, what's the coolest way to like take a first step, all right? First step towards understanding blockchain and let's just leave it with understanding blockchain. Blockchain B, it's my podcast, listen to it. <laughs> It'll be, can we put a link on the website? We can. Oh, all right, we'll do that. Reading think, on the internet. That's like how I learned anything. <laughs> uh, I would say uh, get your first rare Pepe. Either buy it or if you want one, I can give you one. Yeah. And all you have to do is go on the rare Pepe <sighs> wallet and just copy paste a uh, bunch of numbers and X, Y, L characters, and that's all you have to do. And then I'll just send it to you, and you'll get it. And that's gonna be a very first, uh, easy approach to it. And that's the way I got into it. My first wallet was Pepe Wallet, so that's why I recommend it. It was really easy. Um, mine would be, I'm very much a learn by doing type of person, so I would say step one, download Coinbase. Yep. Step two, Step two, buy the crypto. Step three, move it to a wallet like Toshi, which is built by Coinbase, and you can get it in the app store. And then use that crypto for something other than investing or trying to trade it in a profit. Buy art, 
use it to power a you know, stake tree and fund a really interesting project, maybe use it to fund a social media-like website, um, run a social media website, I should say, like Peepith or um, with uh, any other version of, you know, a Steam it is another great example of using social media on a decentralized way. So that's my advice is get it, um, actually use it so you can understand what the future is going to be like and then align yourself with where you think this is going to go because I promise you it's a pretty magical moment once you realize how unique this is and how different it is from anything you've ever done. I agree, once you have money on the line, that's when you, you start just digging into it. And really the, the investment part is the sexiest part of how you get people interested in this and then it's up to them to lose interest in that and focus on blockchain's potential. So putting money on it is how you end up falling asleep with a phone in your hand reading articles. Uh, may I disagree? Uh, how about you just try and earn crypto? You don't have to bring your hard earned money into it. Just try and get into the community and get your own crypto without having to buy it, but earning it. To trade it, one of my most profitable crypto trades was for a, a Zoller, which is an emotionally pegged currency, versus Bitcoin like four years ago. <laughs> so um, I don't know how many crypto to emotionally pegged currency exchanges are done. I think I was the first. Okay. So we only have five minutes for questions. So this is what I'm going to ask, because I think we all have a lot of feelings and things to say. I'm going to say, if you have a question, you can come up and ask it. Please keep your question to 20 seconds. Are you all staying here all, all like afterwards for a little bit? Or do you have to run? Okay. So if you have something longer than 20 seconds to say, it can happen very, very shortly. Um, but if you have a question, come up here. Or I will talk for another four minutes. Well, I'll ask another question. Hey. hey. So my name is Richie. Um, I could go back to the value uh, discussion you were having in exchange, and I'm just thinking about when PayPal first came to be about. Uh, I'm just wondering, are you got any of you guys coders? Okay. So um, I imagine coding can also be considered like a form of art, and you know you can go along the lines of what that means in terms of value as well. And it's considered free speech as well. Yes. So so in conjunction to like. What would be value um, from PayPal being what it was to being now if y'all make to spend money online because of that? Um, and what that exchange meant? I can go deeper. I'm not really sure how to form the question, but it ultimately ends with from the government and like all that sort of like where you think that relates to. Are you asking why we need cryptocurrency when we already have PayPal and Venmo? No, more, more, more in the sense of um, when we talk about value in exchange, okay. what creates value in terms of the art? Um, and, yeah. So, what cre All right, well, let's answer. Like, like, yeah, we got it. Okay, so I would say what, so taking away from the technology and back to uh, art and, and art of all forms, physical, digital, you name it. Um, I think that there is a blend between intrinsic value and extrinsic value. And let me explain that. So I think on the intrinsic side, people invest in or rather buy art all the time because it speaks to them as an individual or because it speaks to the collective story, right? The legend, the folklore. Um, I think that those two blends of just really loving something because it either speaks to you as an individual or to your niche or to society more broadly, I think that in and of itself has value and people want that. And then I think there's also extrinsic value, which comes from then showing off your taste, your style, and your collector abilities and your curation, which is why you have private galleries, which is why you have public galleries, which is why there is value in curation as well to find, you know, weed the, you know, wheat from the chaff and find the ones that all speak towards a certain idea um, and then present those. So I think that there is both, you know, art has its value in and of itself, but it also has value because other people view our taste in art and we take that as important to ourselves. Yeah, I do. I like this. Everyone should check out Rare. Do you have a question? All right, this is going to be our, our last question. Thank you. Hi, uh, I would direct this question to the people who identify as artists in the uh, If you could speak to 
the crypto community. Uh, what would you ask or what would you desire for the crypto community to do for you as a user? Great question. I would say uh, my desires are being fulfilled. <laughs> And that's why um, I'm a big advocate of the uh, crypto space uh, because I see a very uh, big um, attempt to build communities. Uh, these platforms, high-tech elites, let's say, in the blockchain space, are investing, are putting their eyes on art. And I wonder, why is that? It's not necessarily because, oh, we are so good and artists need help. It's more like they see the value in art and they're seeing that artists and the communities in art are kind of being used in a way as um, sort of a tests for these technologies to, to be tried on. And I think that's great. And there's a lot of resources in the crypto space. And I love how there's a sort of symbiotic relationship happening between artists and these platforms that seem to, to be both gaining equally. So, so you're satisfied. I am really satisfied, yes. That's awesome. Yes, it's a great space. John, Welcome. are you satisfied, John? I, well, I, I would say that uh, I'm encouraged um, I sit on both sides of that from, you know, considering myself a creative, but not a visual artist. Uh, but also as a creative, you know, building a company and a project in the space. Uh, but then on the flip side, also being a technologist and implementing that technology, this so what we believe to be, you know, the biggest problem out there is actually creating digital scarcity and resale value around digital art. Um, because we think by just unlocking that, we can create a whole new genre of art. Um, everything from animation to three-dimensional design and so forth, we think it's an entirely new asset class that's yet to be discovered. That's my take, that's the solution that I'm trying to build. Um, but to take a step back and say, am I satisfied with the current state of the technology, and I am not satisfied. Um, and that's normal, and that's not something that anyone is responsible for, that's just the nature of where we are. Yeah. Think about the difference, right, between liking on Facebook and getting that instant gratification versus say, for example, you were on Amazon and there was one left in stock of the one thing you needed and then you're not gonna know whether or not you got it between, oh, I don't know, 30 seconds, maybe three minutes, maybe 30 minutes. Because it's the blockchain. It just will, the transaction will get picked up when it gets picked up, maybe you want it, maybe you didn't. But that's the scaling problem right there, which is that the transactional throughput right now very much feels more like the dial-up era, where you can't have things like YouTube because the internet connections are too slow. The transaction processing power is too slow right. the chain. So there's so a lot of coming. Physical, I mean, some of this is like the practical evolution of technology. Yeah, lots of that. That's my frustration. It's so just you like, need it's time like, machine would well, solve a lot what of What we need is we need infrastructure tools, and we need developers, um, and we and, and we need people, really smart people, working really hard on these problems. Um, and I think that comes also with an attitude of helping the community and committing to open source and trying to help other projects in the space so that this can all become something rather than it all becoming nothing. Do you have, do you want to, is there anything you would like the crypto community to work on? Now is a great time to make requests. I'm having trouble thinking of the artist's name, but there is this older German artist, and um, he he has a, like a specific contract, or like a resale rights contract that he's always used, and he's gotten like a lot of flack for it in the commercial art world for using it, but it also is a really good filtering system to see like who who he wants to be his collectors. And essentially they have to like pay a resale royalty when they like resell it and if the value goes up, etc. And it would be cool for someone to like do that, make that like available for artists, but without but make it like open source so that they don't take a cut. Um, I've been approached by like <laughs> some startups uh, like 
that like essentially just want to take a, like you know they want to like take a cut and it'd be interesting if it could just be like code that the art artist himself could like implement without it being like you know not not to knock on I don't know the specific <laughs> some artists but like yeah. Okay, so that's a really clear request, an artist contract that gives them residual rights where we've actually gotten rid of the middle person. Make your make your payments and, and make your payments and some of it goes to the artist and some of it carries on. I will say that's not rare art, but rare art is doing something a little different, so that's worth that's that's worth exploring too. Um like many really great conversations, um, I come away with more questions than I do answers, and I really, really, really thank all of you uh, for being here. I thank everyone in the audience for being here. Um, I think that last question was really important. Um, for me, um, there's a beauty in the way that artists see the world. It's not common, right? It is uncommon, and that is why we use the term artist for them. Um, if I can make a request of the crypto community, uh, we've spent a lot of time in the finance space. Um, I do not believe we have found the best solutions for us as humans yet, and I do not believe that artists will find those best solutions on their own. But as I look through history and why I'm so excited to sit with all of you, um, oftentimes art artists are a fuel or a seed of something that becomes much bigger. We talked about the Sistine Chapel, we talked about digitizing rose petals, we talked about architecture, we talked about galleries as a way of seeing, right? Like, and, and so I do think there's something there. So if you're not an artist but you're a crypto expert, Go help an artist understand what it is you do all day and then listen and then explain and then listen and then explain and like someday maybe you'll save us all. Um, so, uh, thank you everybody. Um, we have some time after this. Please ask questions. Um, can the artists who created the works on the walls, can you just stand up and wave? I, don't, I know Susan is here, who else is here? Julie, there's Julie. All right, well Susan and Julie are here. Ju you wanna look at Julie's art through a phone? if you want, which is really cool. Um, so thank you all. Um, a last thing, uh, we want to make the art easy to see as quickly as possible. Two last things. So the first is, um, if you're able to, if it's not a problem, could you fold your chair with you and just bring it around the corner so we get these out of the gallery? And after you do that, um, no, please find someone you don't know here and ask them why they're here. Tell them, Noah said I should ask you why you're here. <laughs> and then see what happens, okay? So a big round of applause to everybody. Thank you so much. And thank you, Noah, for some of your